Thank you very much and over to you. Now, so hello and welcome to our panel, Inequalities in Higher Education, a Global Perspective. Thank you very much for joining the session. My name is Bronwyn Deacon. I am a doctoral researcher at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. And I organized this panel together with Anne Leiser, who works at the head office at the Global Learning Council. She will coordinate and moderate the panel today, uh, whereas my job is to present to you the study on which the panel is based upon beforehand. So the study is a joint project between the GLC and the HIIG. The GLC is a cross-sector think tank committed to connecting leaders of digital education transformation, and the HIIG is a hub for internet research where we explore the economic, economic, political, and societal impact of digitalization. Regarding the presentation uh, of the study, I will give an overview of the study, um, present the main findings on inequalities and collaboration, and then hand over to Anna for the discussion. And um, the discussion will be with four, hopefully, great panelists. I say four, hopefully, because one is still trying to connect, but uh, I will live. Uh, I will leave the introduction to our panelists just to name them quickly, so you know who awaits you. We have Amy Ogan, professor of learning science from the Carnegie Mellon University. Um, Pam Fredman, president of the International Association of Universities, who's probably and hopefully joining soon. Um, Jeff Gabriel. Uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Student Education at the University of Leeds. And uh, last but not least, Barbara Mo Moser Merka, visiting professor at the University of Nairobi. So let me start with the overview of the study. Before COVID hit, we all heard about the promises and assumptions made mainly by educational technology providers about teaching and learning which um, are mainly that it will lead to more equitable access and better learning outcome. And we wanted to find out how this actually plays out in reality and um, yeah, asked ourselves, is digitalization invitably an improvement and does it lead to equitable access and better learning outcome? For our study, we then formulated a more broad research question, um, which is, did the rapid digital push of 2020 affect positive long-term change for higher education? Um, because we did not only want it to test assumptions, but rather be open to any other theme and topics um, that we can find in the real world, which is why the study is of qualitative and explorative nature. Our target group was um, higher education leaders from uh, all world regions, and the data was collected in three stages. So first we had a questionnaire with 85 higher education leaders um, in 22 countries. It had open and closed questions uh, on their immediate response to the crisis in terms of challenges and support structures about innovation and collaboration inequalities and long-term effects. The second data collection um, was done by conducting 11 contextual interviews in nine countries then, retrieving the participants from the same sample. Um, and the focus here was on contextual features such as revenue, competition, access, inequalities, government support and institutional support, as these themes were frequently mentioned in the questionnaire. Um, the third round was a follow-up questionnaire with 38 participants from uh, 17 countries about strate strategic responses to digital education. And our findings showed ambiguity towards the previous mentioned themes of access and learning outcomes. Access does not necessarily get more equal and learning outcomes also not automatically better. Nevertheless, they can improve if very broadly speaking, the right support systems um, are in place. And this is why um, more equitable access and better learning outcomes require guide rails. 
it was also very ob obvious that because of the pandemic and through moving teaching online, inequalities have, have become more visible. And we also found that even though inequalities vary by region, they still occur all over the world. So for example, internet connection and home environment, they were pro problematic everywhere, um, but the problem did not always have the same extent um, across the regions. And here you can see a small overview of inequalities of factor that influence inequalities at different levels of higher education institutions. You also refer to as barriers. So individual, on the individual level, we have systematic inequalities and lack of digital literacy. Systematic inequalities are mostly reported on the student side, um, but applies, of course, also for lectures and staff at higher education institutions. Same as for lack of digital literacy, where it's mostly reported as a huge barrier for lectures, but again, not exclusively for them as students, for example, also struggled with the use of digital tools, for example. On institutional and system level, the structure of organizations, um, revenue and funding, and also infrastructure and resources can turn into major barriers and create inequalities. Our findings uh, reveal also another important theme connected actually to a lot of optimism, and this is growing collaboration. Collaboration has many facets. It can direct at internationalization, sharing knowledge, exchanging ideas, open educational resources, and so on. And collaboration also seems to affect access and learning outcomes because working collaboratively on individual or on institutional level can affect other themes positively. So here, um, for example, access and learning outcomes. We also want to stress that collaboration exists and can exist across individual, institutional levels, institutions and systems, as we also try to highlight this with the different, icon, different icons you can see here on the slide. Um, so yeah, there are different levels and forms of collaboration that we can talk about. I will now read four quotes from our study to you, three regarding collaboration on different levels, so individual level, institutional and system level, and a fourth overarching and a bit critical statements towards collaboration as final food for thought for my side before I hand over to Anna. So um, one higher education leader from Australia um, said, uh, towards collaboration on individual level. The most positive outcome has been the willingness of staff to embrace change in a period of crisis and to reach out to colleagues and share learnings. Um, on the level, uh, on the institutional level, a higher education leader from Sweden stated, we are able to use the opportunity that the crisis present to advance on lifelong learning, to strengthen collaboration across departments and disciplines to renew our educational offering. And then for collaboration on the system level, again, a higher education leader from Australia stated, we have found it very helpful to collab collaborate nationally with institutions, more on approaches and rapid shared learnings rather than resources. And here a bit longer quote that I want to leave in the open before we start the discussion. I think that collaboration is absolutely essential if we are to meet the challenges of this historical moment. All of our challenges are transnational in character and we require institutional capacities and human cap capabilities to address this across the world. This means that we need to reimagine our global collaboration to teach across institutions, nations and continents. But our existing partnerships undermine this. It instead accelerates the brain drain by weakening global institutional capacities. Universities are too focused on the brand that they have forgotten their institutional mission. And that was a statement by a higher education leader from the United States. And on that note, I will give over to Anna. Thank you also for sharing the presentation, Anna. No problem. Okay, 
So we are still missing Pam, unfortunately, but um, I'm sure the discussion is going to be very interesting anyway, because we have really great panelists here. Um, and I would actually just like to ask each of you to just introduce yourselves very quickly and provide a little bit of uh, context of um, your work and your experiences of the past one, two, or maybe more years. Um, Barbara, can I start with you? Yes, yeah, thanks, Anne, and uh, thanks, Bronwyn, for the presentation of the research. Very interesting, and uh, I will obviously be tuning into the last comment as well. Uh, so my name is Barbara Moser Mercer. I um, used to work for the University of Geneva uh, for many, many years. I um, have uh, retired from that university and I'm now visiting professor at the University of Nairobi. So for the past uh, 11 years, I uh, have worked in higher education in emergencies. Uh, and uh, what that means is it's kind of an emerging field. Uh, especially at the higher education level. Uh, it means that uh, we are um, trying to offer higher education opportunities uh, to those living in fragile contexts. Um, in other words, in refugee camps, IDP camps, uh, and other uh, contexts that are considered fragile. So with that, uh, that will then yep. obviously be the perspective from which I will comment mm -hmm. on certain statements. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Amy, can I move on to you next? Yes, thank you for an excellent presentation that I think captured quite a lot of the uh, issues that were, arose during the pandemic. Um, my name is Amy Ilgen. I'm a professor uh, in the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, my research revolves around the design and deployment of educational technologies. Um, and during the pandemic, I was teaching uh, at Carnegie Mellon's campus in Rwanda. So I had the um, uh, experience of beginning teaching during the pandemic in one country and then uh, moving uh, at the end of the semester to uh, back to my home campus in Pennsylvania in the United States and then uh, continuing to teach uh, from here. So I was able to view sort of two different contexts in the global south and the global north uh, and get an understanding of the challenges and barriers uh, as well as the opportunities that the students found uh, in each of these cases. Great, thank you. I see that Pam is here. We're so happy to have you. I will uh, continue the introduction with Jeff, and then um, after Jeff, maybe you can uh, introduce yourself in your context uh, very briefly, just a quick heads up. Jeff. Yes, hi, I'm Jeff Grable. I've, uh, I'm at the University of Leeds. Uh, this is week 12 for me at, as the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Student Education. I've spent the last 30 years, um, believe it or not, we've had digital technologies around that long to support learning. Um, interested in, in how digital technologies support learning in, in my pedagogical domain, which is writing instruction. Um, for the previous 19 years, I was at Michigan State University in the United States. I was the Associate Provost for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. And I was responsible for pivoting that very large, very traditional university to remote instruction on a dime. So um, can certainly speak to our experiences at Michigan State. Um, and also, I, I, I'm getting up to speed as quickly as possible on uh, the experience at Leeds uh, in that in this similar pandemic moment and what we think the future uh, of digital learning and education at the University of Leeds will be. It has some components focused on um, the globe and it also, uh, we're trying to catch up with uh, the way in which the pandemic probably accelerated some things that have been in play for a long time. So um, it's, been a, it's been an adventurous uh, two years. Mm -hmm. I imagine. Um... Pam, if I'm not putting you on the spot, maybe you can say just a, a quick couple of words, just introducing yourself and your context. Yeah, my name is Pam Fredman, and uh, I'm uh, um, participating mainly as the, the uh, president for the International Association of Universities, where we actually have followed the ongoing process and the pushing of uh, uh, online uh, education and also in research. I have a long experience as the uh, rector for university and I have also worked in, in different groups when it comes to education of different parts. Uh, 
I'm particularly interested in following this uh, from the, the global perspectives, uh, as I see that there is so much of diversity and so many different challenges. And currently, I'm sitting in the disciplinary board of Swedish University, and I follow there what has happened when it comes to uh, deceiving uh, during examinations, which we, I see is an upcoming problem. And very, very important quality and equality perspective. Great, thank you. Um, so maybe I can uh, go back to Amy simply because I think uh, you have the most uh, the most comparison between contexts uh, from a firsthand perspective. Um, maybe can you tell me what um, is sort of is there maybe one finding or one learning that you one one observation that you made during your time teaching in these two contexts um, that you can share with us that might be interesting for people who have only sort of known their one context uh, during the pandemic yeah so um maybe that high level idea is is the variation in barriers and challenges that students experienced uh and yet the very fact that there were barriers and challenges uh, across a lower infrastructure setting and higher infrastructure setting. Um, so uh, to go into a little bit more detail, um, it, while I was teaching in Kigali, um, one of the main barriers that students encountered there was um, that while the, uh, the internet infrastructure in Rwanda was robust and they were able to, during a non-crisis situation, uh, engage in homework and in, in experiences online. Uh, when the pandemic hit and transformed the entire uh, city <laughs> into a remote working and learning environment, uh, the infrastructure was not able to support that sufficiently. And so as we had uh, you know, every person who was was working in a remote um, working environment, trying to access the internet all day long, uh, the students uh, struggled greatly to be able to access sufficient infrastructure that would allow them to be on on uh, the network. Um, so that was a big barrier for the students there um, uh, engaging. In, in that connection, connected practice, and therefore many activities had to be transformed in a way that would allow them to be engaged in asynchronously or in an, an alternative fashion. Whereas when I moved back to teaching in the United States, um, those specific infrastructure challenges were less present. Uh, but one of the main challenges that the students felt during this time uh, was actually um, the tension in uh, social presence online, um, where um, many of the students felt it was very beneficial to have a deep social presence. So um, they wanted to connect with their peers, with the instructor, to be present online. And that was something that they in greatly missed about the in-person environment. And yet at the same time, there was a tension about uh, exposing themselves while they were in a home environment, uh, while um, there was a camera staring at them all day. And so I think this caused an enormous challenge for the students uh, um, in terms of their connecting to others and also in the terms of their mental health and how they experienced the, the challenges of the pandemic uh, while they were attempting to do this online. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Particularly with regard to the uh, low infrastructure context, um, I'm wondering if, uh, Barbara, you have maybe similar experiences from, um, from the fragile environments in which uh, you are witnessing higher education um, in the African context as well. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so low uh, level infrastructure and poor connectivity are kind of the building blocks on which <laughs> you're trying to build uh, a digital 
uh, higher education emergencies uh, program uh, and speaking from the perspective of uh, the African uh, University Network for Higher Education Emergencies, I think we had a leg up uh, when the pandemic started. Emergencies were exactly what we've been doing all along. So we realized that, well, yes, it's just another emergency. Uh, and uh, what actually then was the real problem was how can we continue to emphasize and build uh, the collaborative aspect on the ground uh, when uh, refugees, for example, in a camp could no longer come to the learning hub uh, to work together on assignments uh, uh, or to discuss. So for us, it was more of a challenge to see, okay, how do we implement all the health guidelines that in the humanitarian context were very strict uh, because when you talk about spreading uh, during the pandemic, then obviously a camp is, is it, it goes like wildfire. Uh, you don't have any health infrastructure to speak of. So trying to see how can we preserve the human element in all of it, um, because we knew uh, from years of doing higher education emergencies that that was one of the crucial uh, things that would um, guarantee uh, good learning outcomes. So the social emotional learning part and how do we do social emotional learning online? Uh, that was that was much more of a challenge. Uh, and given that there was a very, very clear rise in gender-based violence, in violence in general, uh, in in camps, uh, we, we really had to pay a lot more attention to that. Um, so with regard to connectivity and infrastructure, uh, I think, as I said, we'd learned for many years that we need to base ourselves on very low connectivity, on interrupted connectivity. We, you cannot transpose uh, your face-to-face -face learning online. That's entirely impossible. Very little direct lecturing and live lectures. Those things are, are a no-no in those contexts. Uh, everything has to be reimagined uh, in terms of um, pr promoting independent learning. Uh, which in with the learning cultures, and I'm sure Amy can confirm that, in the learning cultures that uh, I've been working in, mostly in, in Africa and in the Middle East, uh, in those refugee contexts, uh, independent learning is obviously not uh, valued, is not something that is part of the pedagogical uh, tradition. Um, but the acceptance of digital learning in Africa is actually very high. In the Middle East, it had been very low. So that was another systemic problem, but I can get to that a little later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, the common themes that I'm hearing is that in low infrastructure environments, the infrastructure is a necessary but not sufficient factor, but then we really must also pay attention to the, the social factors, the community factors, and the learning modes of individuals um, in order to facilitate the learning when there is no physical campus that students can, where students can learn or um, the learning environments that students can usually, um, yeah, go to. Um, Jeff, I know that um, when we spoke um, previously, we had also talked about uh, campus infrastructure being essential to equity. Um, maybe, is there something that from your experiences, maybe even in contrast, US and UK, um, is there something that you're seeing in terms of the campuses being essential to that, that you could speak to? Yeah, I think one of the things, uh, I'll speak a little bit to that and, and equity issues just a little bit more broadly during the last uh, couple of years in, in a relatively rich environment, right? The United States and, and the UK with regard to infrastructure. One of the things that we learned at Michigan State and at Leeds, again, uh, I think maybe we forgot it, is that our campus infrastructure is an essential part of our ability to make learning more accessible and more equitable uh, to students who come from uh, environments and families of origin, communities of origin that might be a little bit more deprived. And so when we, when we, when we sent them away from campus, we also sent them away not just from really good um, bandwidth, hardware, software, but we sent them away from the stability of housing and food, which for some of our students, uh, was a critical factor um, and the, the a quiet place to study that is the ability to organize physical space um, to help them with their intellectual development all of that uh, went out the window and we really did have students who were 
um, in cars, outside McDonald's restaurants, um, everywhere in the United States, because McDonald's has pretty good Wi-Fi, um, trying to hop on a network um, in a quiet place, a car, um, it's suboptimal way to learn in, in so many res respects. So we relearned that lesson um, and really had some significant equity challenges that we had to scramble to, to deal with in terms of providing um, hardware, software, and network access on the fly to students that were distributed all over the world. And it was, uh, it was remarkable, I think, how well the institutions I was a part of were able to do that. Um, but it also called into question um, some fundamentals about how we thought about what our students, our assumptions about what our students had access to and what they really needed. Um, so it was a really um, challenging moment for us intellectually, ethically, morally. Um, but the, the equity, real quickly, the equity issues, I think, are even more complicated. So the, the, we did see both at Michigan State at the University of Leeds, persistence, continuation, graduation, attainment gaps. Um, widen for some populations and close for others in ways which didn't, we expected them to travel in the same direction, but we had a much more complicated set of outcomes. Uh, for some students, the use of digital technologies, the affordances of digital technologies to support learning, including the ability to access people and materials at times which were more convenient for them, the ability to slow down content delivery, the ability to track and trace um, their learning activities because of digital platforms meant that they were more successful. Um, but for other populations and other learners, um, they were they were less su su um, successful. Uh, and I think the last thing that the pandemic taught us with regard to the larger context and this this helped is a, is an important container for equity issues is that you know both Michigan State and Leeds are primarily residential institutions and the students are there for a primarily residential experience. Um, their reaction to a primarily online and digital learning experience was not necessarily positive, uh, in part because they didn't sign up for it. And so what we learned again and again and again is that our students who choose an online experience and students who choose a residential experience are two very different student populations with very different needs. And those of us who run online programs know that um, we learned it again and again and again that we needed to be engaged with our students based on, with some empathy based around their experiences, their expectations and their needs. Um, and that forced us to, to, to it was really challenging uh, for us to relearn some lessons as institutions and as educators. Um, so I, I won't go on, I could, but uh, the equity issues were complicated and, and remain complicated. Yeah. Um, Pam, you had also um, previously told me that um, you feel that universities are and should be the key actors for democracy. And based on what Jeff also said now that uh, the campuses kind of, or the universities, but also the campuses kind of function as an equalizer um, and can therefore um, sort of take up a unique position in um, providing some kind of stability in this uh, learning environment. Um, how, how do you think that universities can sort of manage both the expectations towards students and also um, on a larger societal level in, in uh, kind of working towards, um, yeah, equitable democracies? I think that, that I, we have all experienced and there is a lot of experience from the push online uh, education and I think that we have to leave that uh, behind us as soon as possible and go forward and see uh, what can we do uh, when it comes to quality and I raise this issue because um, sometimes uh, there is even governments who says that this online uh, movement or transformation is fine because you can have students learning and it's uh, I think it's cheaper but there is another perspective on the campus and within the higher education. And that is not just learning a discipline. It's so many other skills uh, you have to learn at the university. It's, uh, the, the German expression of Bildung is very, very important for the future of our societies. And I, I see that that would be problematic in most countries to live up to this, this type of skills, uh, uh, learning uh, online. So uh, looking forward, I would say that uh, probably we have to face the fact that online is, as uh, Jeff and the others said, it's very good. Lifelong learners think that this is a possibility. They can study from home. And some students choose to be online and some students want to be on campus. 
But I don't think that we should um, divide these groups. I think that still we need the campus, the face-to-face uh, -face meetings, the interactions between individuals, if we want to have the values of our universities. But we probably have to have the blended uh, form that you can have certain parts being more instructive or informative, but then really develop the uh, time on campus and the time we interact with each other as persons. And what I hear from, from many international discussions on this, I think that this is the perspective most countries and most universities look upon today. Thank you. Um, Barbara, I, first I saw you nodding to the first part um, and I was wondering how, how in this in your context um do you teach additional skills and do you do you manage to sort of bring that experience to students if at all um that classical universities can usually do on a campus or by building this community and by sort of um yeah working on these other social and uh, democratic skills Yes, without, you know, being able to go into the much larger question of why higher education in emergencies. So that, you know, could be the topic for a whole other uh, conference. Uh, but uh, I, I think from the very beginning uh, and the earliest qualitative studies on tertiary education and emergencies, it became very obvious that one of the key uh, objectives of bringing in the tertiary level uh, was to allow learners living in those contexts, uh, giving them a space for critical thinking and interacting uh, with, uh, with, with information and knowledge in a way uh, that is not one directional. Um, I, I think that's that's always been one of the key objectives. Uh, essentially, you know, it, there. Yes, there is a whole field of peace education, um, but uh, you, you don't teach peace in a direct way. Uh, you, you design pedagogies that allow people uh, to learn skills uh, and acquire competencies that will convince them that actually living peacefully is better for their communities. Uh, and that's really where we have invested a great deal over the years now. It's understanding what kinds of pedagogies uh, in the digital space will enable that kind of learning, will foster that kind of learning. Uh, and, you know, time and again, I'm saying, yeah, we have, weren't really hit by this emergency. <laughs> you know, we, we had been living in this situation for so long. There was no change, actually, in the way we did things, with the only distinct difference being, well, the maximum group size was maybe two or three. Uh, and, you know, I had to design uh, the, the learning activities in such a way that it wouldn't take uh, more than two or three people uh, and students, you know, to, to put it together. Um, I, I, I really believe that we have to put a whole lot more thinking into the pedagogical side of things. Uh, there's been such uh, an emphasis on the tech side um, so much of that at tech is unusable in fragile contexts, uh, and it doesn't get any better. Uh, on the contrary, I, I think it gets more sophisticated, and the more sophisticated it gets, uh, the more it's going to break down. Uh, you know, when, when, when it's 45 or 50 degrees, you don't have a laptop running uh, in a refugee camp period. So you really need to think carefully about, you know, when can you use technology? Uh, and how can you use it and for what are you going to use it? Um, but the focus needs to be on, uh, on quality digital learning. Uh, and, and in that, I, I, I do believe that uh, the world really has a lot to catch up on. Uh, from the emergency remote teaching to going to the quality digital learning, there is, there is still a ways to go. And I do agree with Pam. Uh, yes, a blended mode is ultimately what uh, I think we're, you know, the world's going to be shifting to. Um, I, I do have a concern, however, with regard to the technology part and this 
uh, myth about, well, technology is going to fix it. Uh, I think we, we've all learned that it's not going to fix it. Um, I think in fragile contexts, what I've seen is that uh, there is a tendency to parachute uh, uh, knowledge information into fragile contexts. Uh, and uh, that the context themselves and the learners themselves are having to interact with epistemologies and ways of knowing and ways of learning uh, that are totally alien to them. Uh, and I think when we talk about equity uh, and access, um, I, for me, access is in part physical, but in large part intellectual. Uh, and I think uh, we really, really need to think about decolonizing that field uh, and valuing the epistemologies and ways of knowing and learning locally. And I think our challenge here is also to think of, well, how can technology facilitate that? Uh, you know, how, how can we turn the tables and say, well, it's not just an equalizer. No, on the contrary, it can actually be a disequalizer, if that's a word. Uh, it, can, it can have the opposite uh, effect. Uh, and it can perpetuate colonial ways of uh, of of, uh, of learning, uh, and 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 further aggravate an already very difficult situation. So sorry, that was a bit long, but I I wanted to kind of distinguish between different types of access because so much is actually. So many people emphasize, oh well, everyone can access it. Well, we've heard from Jeff, we've heard from Amy. No, that's not the case. Uh, and Pam said the same thing. Uh, but the intellectual access is what, what, uh, what I would also like to bring into the conversation. Thank you. I think that's a really valuable contribution because uh, I, I haven't often heard about intellectual ac access. We've heard about the digital divide and the new digital divide in terms of digital literacy skills. Um, but the fact that even the learning environment itself um, is often not accessible. Um, in, in terms of the actual learning and the way that learning is produced and the way that it is uh, culturally embedded and therefore not accessible for different types of learners and learners from different types of cultures and contexts um, is, is really a valuable addition to that. Um, I want to, because I, I saw so much uh, nodding and, and agreement, um, I want to just sort of give you the, the opportunity to jump in with your comments if you have some without calling on someone specific. Um, uh, I, to speak to Barbara's last point, I, I think this is a really important one. And I think the field of educational technology is, uh, beginning to realize the importance of these issues um, and, uh, and introducing new, well, existing methodologies that are being brought into the, the field, such as code design, uh, where we're actually engaging with um, learners from the environment, for, with teachers from the environment, with those who actually have the expertise and uh, understand those ways of knowing and being that are so essential uh, in uh, that process of uh, transformational change for these learners, um, such that uh, there's, there's some movement towards an understanding of the, the critical issues that Barbara has just brought up. I don't think that we're really there yet, and there's, there is a, a whole another subset of the field that's working on, uh, as, as mentioned, uh, pushing towards more and more sophisticated uh, and more uh, infrastructure heavy, more um, institutionalized ways of learning. And so I think it's really important that we bring forward those examples of work that's being done um, at that level uh, to really um, change the, the practices uh, and the dominance of a Western point of view in the development of educational technologies. So this is why I've been extremely excited over the last few years to be working with groups like, for instance, the MasterCard Foundation um, is supporting a large cohorts of entrepreneurs uh, across the African context to work in the ed tech field themselves 
developing solutions that are actually appropriate for local environments uh, with the local governments, the local teachers, the local students themselves, uh, such that there is, are alternatives to um, introducing a more globalized uh, solution that may not uh, actually serve those learners well. Pam, did you want to add yeah. something to that? Go ahead. Yeah. I would like to, to add to that. Um, I think what you said, Barbara, is, is very important. And uh, I think it's time for university to take the leadership. How, how do we see the future of university? How do we provide what we are experts and the key role we play in societies for different groups, for different people, lifelong learning and students of different character with different socioeconomic backgrounds, and then see how technology can assist that development. We are now pushing that technology, this is here, and then we try to transform what we are doing in the university to the technology. So uh, uh, that was a message in, in some uh, seminars I, I uh, attended uh, recently, and I think this is a message I would like to bring forward, that the leadership of universities take the, res take the responsibility, I think that Universities are the best, they have the best competence to see what is needed and no one knows the future. It's an unshaped future and we can, we can provide, uh, uh, to say, uh, knowledge to that area. And uh, I would say that even in a country like Sweden, we think that we have the infrastructure, we have uh, welfare and we have all, the, we have a large number of groups who will never come to the universities, who will never manage to be online and has, has different possibilities. And one more thing that hasn't been brought up, which is, and that is that we uh, get more and more reports now on the uh, increased gender inequality when it comes to the online transfer. Women are those taking most of the responsibility at home. They have the, the highest burden and probably most difficulties to, to study online. And that there is also, and I think that you from the African countries also support that, that this has been a way for them to, to, to get out of the families, to get a new environment and to develop themselves as individuals. And technology will not help them at home. And this, this is something everyone has to see, all countries, that the inequality when it comes to gender is pushing forward with the, uh, the situation we have right now. Yeah, I think it's um, going back to, to the previous points, uh, because Brahman had also presented on the, the food for thought quote, which also mentioned the brain drain. And during the pandemic, I think there was a lot of voices who were optimistic that collaborative teaching designs um and many of these were informal and many of these were just uh you know sort of hastily put together um would be maybe able to counteract some of the bigger effects um and some of the bigger systemic inequalities that we'd seen um between regions and between countries and between systems um by allowing students from all over to join via digital tools and to then be together in classrooms. And if the university had international students to even focus on asynchronous teaching and learning um, and thereby sort of make that space more open. Um, and right now I'm unsure how much of that has been formalized and how many, how much of these approaches that kind of sprung up spontaneously are really being considered as long-term strategies um and this was where we had had this optimism that perhaps collaborative um efforts would help alleviate some of these other issues in the long run and right now i'm a bit more skeptical that these are sort of finding a, a way into long-term strategies um because we are sort of nearing the last um the last what is it uh 20-ish minutes <laughs> of the panel. Um, maybe um, a very concrete question that's probably not going to have a straightforward answer. How can we move toward more collaboration and um, equity in higher education? Um, and I know that you all come from different 
systems and contexts. And so maybe there are different answers that we can collect here that together can sort of help um, tackle some of these challenges that we've heard from today. Jeff, do you have anything in mind? Well, I have no solutions, but but let me let me pile on mm -hmm. with the problems. I, I want to <laughs> reflect re reflect a little bit on what Amy and Pam and and Barbara have all said, and on the last quotation from from the American University um, uh, president or leader that you interviewed about the challenges of global education, and you know the 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 demand and the need for education um, on the on a planetary scale is significant. Um, it will require a planetary response, to be quite honest with you, and that will require um, some humility with regard to how um, universities um, in the northern hemisphere or in the richer parts of the world uh, engage with partners. And so I think one of the real challenges that my boss, the vice chancellor at the University of Leeds, very much wants to take on is, can we engage in authentic um, collaborative design of solutions um, for the educational needs, desires, aspirations, and hopes of, of our fellow human beings elsewhere on the planet. And um, that, that may be in a context where higher education is exceptionally difficult to access. Um, I, she's committed to engaging in that really challenging design work. Um, and since I think about systems and how to execute this, I mean, one of the obvious sort of more granular problems we have within that kind of scope is, you know, we have us or uk cost structures um and and delivery modes that have to be adapted significantly for um what is affordable and achievable and, and desirable uh, in, in a very different context and these are these are non-trivial problems um and the silicon way of solving them silicon valley way of solving them isn't isn't going to get us there so um no solutions there but the university of leeds is genuinely committed to being a partner in trying to solve the, the significant collaborative design issues that we have. Thank you. Um, Pam. Yeah, uh, I don't have the solution, but I, I uh, one part is that if we look into the research resources around the world and all different uh, funding agencies, how much money goes into research when it comes to, to pedagogical tools, how to develop education, uh, and that is, very different in different parts of the world. So uh, I, I think that it, it's important to bring forward to these agencies and that we have to have research in this area because there is a lot of different needs to be met and also very many, many uh, possibilities. And when it comes to what Jeff was saying, I, I mean, um, I'm worried because the situation uh, during the COVID is that we get more uh, collaborative within nations and we lose the connections to the, the different parts of the world. And if we connect, we connect uh, west-west and very little north-south. Uh, and that is a responsibility for university. It's not something that we think is funny or not, but it, it's a responsibility. And uh, I have seen many example, examples on where you bring, build up uh, collaborations long cycle, and that builds on both research and education. And you build up the capacity in, in, in both countries uh, and learning from each other. Because we will not see students moving to, to, to the West and then go back. That's, that's the future. We have to educate people where they are and where they can be the, uh, the future challengers and being taking on the uh, democratic and sustainable development. So uh, I hope that everyone can, can, can see the uh, responsibility for the whole globe. And I think that the pandemic showed this. There is no, it doesn't matter. One to 2% in African countries are vaccinated. And here we are sitting and we're looking at figures 60, 70%. And who cares? But we will not solve the problem. We will have this pandemic going on. And there are many other challenges like the climate and so on. So uh, it's time to lift this to the funders, to the agencies, to promote this type of collaboration and go beyond excellence because that is not, will not drive these forces. Um, 
looking towards the learning science researcher, Amy. <laughs> How do you feel about uh, possible solutions for, for these challenges? Uh, I don't think that anyone has the solutions just yet, but I think um, Pam has an excellent point that um, we need uh, people to be empowered to um, take advantage of the learnings that have taken place over the last two years to, um, to, to actually transform those into new solutions and that that should happen at the local level. So I think this is one of those positive changes that have come from this experience uh, is a much deeper recognition of um, the, both the need, but also the opportunity for that to be happening. Um, and so I have observed a number of initiatives already taking place that have been pouring that funding into these opportunities uh, and, in my view, distributing them more equitably, which is essential. So it's not the case that all of that money ought to go to the global north to produce such solutions. So that's one thing that I think is, is makes me more optimistic, uh, that there has actually been an impact of uh, this crisis. And the second part of that is that um, uh, all of the things that Jeff had mentioned about uh, the, the um, equivalent or, or related disparities that we're seeing in the United States uh, has meant that um, at the higher education level of uh, the faculty themselves have been confronted with these realities that these inequities exist within their own classrooms and that we can't just return to pretending that they don't exist. So when you see your students struggling to, to connect online or to find that quiet place where they can actually have a moment to learn, uh, I think it really shows you in a way that maybe you were protected in this more insulated space that this is not something that's only happening in a refugee camp, uh, but that that these are challenges that need to be solved around the world and, and can inspire um, all of us to be open to change and hopefully to also help produce it. Barbara, do you have any, any solutions or any points, any, you know, um, places where we can start looking for, for solutions um, and, and uh, overcoming the challenges? Um, yes, I, I, I continue to be uh, excited uh, about what actually brought me uh, to the South South project. And uh, that was a remit from a donor uh, who wanted an African solution to the African problem of lack of access to tertiary education by refugees. Um, the donor didn't ask for a northern solution, the donor asked for an African solution. Uh, and that continues to inspire me. Uh, I, I think those of us in leadership roles, uh, you know, who are leading these projects or coordinating them or whatever, because I'm in the handover stage now, so it, it was not, you know, for a white woman to lead an African project. Um, so a, a big part of it is, is also handing over now having you know having uh, learned how to build these these infrastructures but i think uh, we do need to speak up uh, about these inequities uh, we shouldn't be silent uh, we shouldn't expect somebody else to solve them uh, i think we need to defend them on a daily basis uh, this kind of thinking really needs to permeate those circles of donors uh, who you know cling to very traditional ways of, uh, of funding um, i've been i've i see very encouraging uh, things happening. Um, I mean, our network received two research grants on the basis of that we would be focusing on participatory research uh, and refugee-led research uh, to inform actually how learning happens in those contexts and to then feed back to the North and others uh, what 
uh, you know, what best practices uh, actually uh, exist and, uh, you know, how we can share. So it's, you know, in a way like reverse uh, innovation, uh, the, the innovation happens in the South and hopefully uh, it will, uh, you know, it will produce more equitable collaborations. I I really thought that the last slide and the quote on the last slide uh, should you know we should give us really food for thought. Uh, that uh, it's not about the brand. Uh, we're all we're all in the same boat, uh, and nobody has the magic solution. Uh, but I think we have values, uh, and when it comes to equity and equitable access. I think if we really live by those values on a daily basis and look at every decision that we have to take from that vantage point, I think we will we will move in the right direction. Maybe I can quickly jump in with a question, uh, with one question from the audience. Thank Jeff you. already answered a little bit in, in the chat, but uh, maybe also for the others. So Cynthia is working at a university in Germany and we highlighted a bit the importance of research and she now points to a bit the frustration that working at the university and the research is the main focus that providing good equitable learning environment is uh, at least of secondary interest. And her question is um, how can we come together to convince universities to see their global education mission and teaching as worthy as research interests? Maybe one or two of you wants to comment, uh, but we also have the reminder that we have four minutes left. One interesting initiative that I have seen uh, in the last year in this space is a donor to the university, the very large donation whose requirement was deep engagement with the local community. Uh, and not only that, but changes in the way that, for instance, um, university tenure and promotion is considered, such that um, supporting local educational missions, supporting um, local um, engagements with the aim of social good uh, become uh, on balance with the research and the university teaching contributions that faculty are making. So I think um, this is also maybe one of those places where money talks as well. And when you put the funding behind it, that's that is something that makes that facilitates change. Pam, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I, I, I have a couple of messages. And first, uh, in, in agreement with Amy, I think that the, the uh, local activities are very, very important. We have to see that within the universities, take responsibility for the merit system. As long as we go on with the merit system we have today with publications in number and, and high prestige journals, we don't reach what we are talking about now. The next thing is that the more we work together with the societies, I think that we can also have the other stakeholders. The day that we have the business sector in particular, but also the uh, public sector supporting what universities are doing and the university's responsibility for society at large and also on a global level, that push the, the governments, that push the politicians and policy makers. And we need those other stakeholders behind. So that's my messages to go forward. Wonderful. Um, as we only have two minutes, um, and I believe we will be cut off <laughs> at the minute mark, um, I just wanted to thank everybody for their valuable input uh, to this discussion. Um, I really appreciated hearing from all of you and learning from your different contexts and actually yeah, i have now noted down a list of things that could be tackled which includes um research on pedagogies empowering local communities and um, creating funding and incentive structures that support those things that we care about uh, namely teaching good quality teaching equitable teaching and collaborations uh, changing the narratives to to make sure that the inequalities uh, remain in the discussion and remain heard um, and including other stakeholders uh, in these efforts to make sure that we are all sort of working toward the mission of higher education. 
So um, I think that already is a pretty uh, good list to start with. And I want to thank you all. And um, also thank you to the audience for um, attending the session with us. Thank you also from my side. Lovely to have you all. Thank you very much. Speak to you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you for putting it together. Thank you. Take care.